Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to the session, Gender Equality, Climate Change, and Funding. We're very happy that you could join us uh, today, uh, as we think we have a very, very exciting panel uh, with some uh, really um, top-notch speakers, uh, and I'm very, very happy that we can get going. Uh, and we have one hour for this session, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to kick off uh, and ask uh, Ms. Anita Bhatia, who is the Deputy Executive Director for UN Coordination, Partnerships, Resources, and Sustainability for UN Women and Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations to please give us her welcome remarks and introduce the session. Over to you, Anita. Thank you very much, Vipo. <clears throat> and it's a great pleasure to be with all of you, distinguished delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to extend a very warm welcome to the Gender Equality, Climate Change and Funding thematic session. It really is wonderful to be here today, although not in person, along with our partners, um, uh, Agence France de Développement, Public Development Banks, Multilateral Development Banks, institutions that collectively drive and encourage investments and actions towards both gender equality and climate justice. On behalf of UN Women, I want to say a huge and very sincere thanks to all of our partners and in particular to IFD for amazing collaboration this last year. I also want to extend sincere and heartfelt appreciation and gratitude to CDP as well as to IFAD for hosting the 2021 summit. And I now would like to share just a few reflections on the interlinkages between gender equality, climate justice, and funding. From our perspective in UN Women, these topics are inextricably linked. In any crisis, whether it is a climate crisis or the pandemic, we know that it is women and girls who often face the greatest impacts. And when we look at the impact, of changes in the climate, we see whether it is through environmental degradation, natural disasters, that women are disproportionately impacted. And yet, in spite of being the group that is the most vulnerable, they are also the group which is benefiting the least currently from solutions that are being crafted to deal with the crisis. And importantly, despite often creating and leading solutions, women are often missing from formal climate leadership, decision-making, investment decisions, innovation, and particularly jobs. We have seen in the pandemic that female labor force participation in all sectors has dropped and climate-related jobs are no different. What we have also seen in the pandemic is that all structural inequalities that existed before the pandemic have in many cases been brought into the sunshine. There a light has been shone on them and in many cases they have become much worse. I at UN Women have been asking for a while, what is it that we can do to ensure that women and girls who are underrepresented in advancing climate justice across all levels and sectors, what is it that we can do that will bring about a radical shift in the state of decision-making with respect to women and climate justice? We know, for example, that in the energy sector globally in 2019, women held 22% of traditional energy jobs and 32% of renewable energy jobs. And that's just their participation in the labor force. That says very little about their participation in decision-making. And we also know that as in many other sectors, limited access to finance is actually restricting investment in climate solutions and recovery from shocks. And this is particularly true for women. So unless urgent action is taken to address these gaps, we know that women's voices and perspectives, which are critical to meeting climate and environmental sustainability, are going to go unrecognized. And so we feel that gender responsive climate and environmental action starts with understanding the linkage between 
the justice and the access to productive resources, including finance. Generation Equality's um, Action Coalition on Feminist Action for Climate Justice has put together a very concrete agenda that includes financing women's and girls' climate solution. It includes supporting the efforts of women, in particular at the grassroots and rural levels, to respond to climate crises. And it includes including <clears throat> and increasing the number of women in climate and environmental jobs, and most importantly, in climate and environmental decision-making. Our vision, and apologies for the noise uh, from New York in the background. You now know for sure that I'm in New York. Uh, our vision is for women and girls really to be represented in their full diversity, but also to have equitable access to climate finance, to technologies, to knowledge, and access and control of natural resources for management, for protection, including through land rights and ownership, where needless to say, once again, we see huge and structural inequalities. And to ensure that gender equality, women's empowerment, and this nexus between equality and climate justice are fully reflected in global efforts to build forward differently. I have stopped saying build back better because I don't like the idea of building back what we had in the past. So to build forward differently, public development banks who are represented in this summit are vital actors who can identify and finance solutions that will focus on this nexus and bring about transformational change. So I'm very pleased now <clears throat> to let you know that through the Finance and Common Coalition on Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment in Development Banks that was formed last year during the first edition of the Finance and Common Summit in November 2020, that UN Women, along with AFD, has co-chaired two work streams with over 50 organizations, which have provided a platform to share expertise and to collaborate on gender equality initiatives. And it is in recognition of this knowledge sharing and of these collaborative efforts that we have been able to come to this particular inflection point where we have completed an extensive report that I'm very pleased to say we are jointly launching today. This report, offers a unique perspective because it provides very concrete examples of how leading public development banks with different mandates, different histories, and different methods of engagement are all committing to and are delivering on the gender equality agenda in their own unique ways. And there is tremendous benefit for public development banks who are interested in understanding how they can address and measure their own gender equality commitments as organizations and with their partners to create a more inclusive and equal world. And this report highlights how public development banks are currently tackling gender equality commitments, recognizing, of course, that this is a long-term journey where results will not be visible immediately. UN Women, I want to assure all of you, is your ally and partner in this journey. We are here to support you, to collaborate, and to help implement and strengthen the work on gender equality and women's empowerment. So I'm very pleased now with that launch to hand over to my distinguished colleague, Mr. Vipul Bhagat, Senior Advisor on Sustainable Finance at UN Women, to share with you some details from the report and to moderate this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anita, for those very inspiring uh, opening remarks. Um, I will uh, ask, uh, and, and you're welcome to stay on as long as you as you can, uh, though, though we understand you have a, um, a high-level last-minute uh, commitment that you have to attend. In the meantime, if I can ask the uh, folks to put up the, the summary of the report, uh, I'm happy to say that the report is uh, I guess now officially launched uh, and will be will be shared, uh, you know, through the press and 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 with with the audience 
um, in electronic form. Uh, and while we're waiting for that, I'll also ask um, uh, the, the, our next panelist who will help us frame the issue as to what the issue was and is that we're trying to address and we're trying to address with, with uh, basically the entire community of public development banks uh, around the world. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, there are over 500 public development banks and, and, and they play a vital role in terms of channeling credit uh, and, and, and also policy advice uh, at the country level, at the regional level, at the global level uh, for, for this very, very important issue. And uh, we've had a superb partnership with AFD to get us this far. Uh, and we're very happy that uh, CDP uh, uh, and, and an EFAD allowed us the platform to uh, launch this report. Um, could we go to the next slide, please, on the report? I just wanted to highlight uh, several uh, points uh, and, su and summarize you know, what is in the report. And essentially, you know, we, we had wanted to uh, firstly, really take take stock of the best practices that existed uh, across the globe at the PDB public development bank level, uh, and also acknowledge some of the uh, uh, best practices that do exist, but also uh, um, recognize some of the shortfalls and shortcomings that may uh, exist uh, in, uh, in 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 various uh, not, not only public development banks but various approaches uh, to address. Uh, gender equality and women's empowerment issues. Uh, and then with that stock take where we acknowledged, uh, you know, the work that is being done, uh, we also wanted to inspire the entire community of uh, over 500 public development banks. I was happy to say that we had about 45 or 50 different members of the working group that helped us uh, put this together under the, the co-authorship of AFD and co-sponsorship of AFD and, and UN Women. Uh, and we had really deep engagement uh, with uh, with the working group members to to help us inspire and go forward on 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 how the larger public development bank community could adopt the recommendations and suggestions that were in the report, and then of course this is all to accelerate uh, our impact and rally the public development banks around prioritizing principles, good practices, uh, and increasing accountability for gender equality uh, globally. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to go through every one of the 10 action items that are listed here, but I think it's important to maybe highlight a couple of points. Uh, item number two, strengthen the commitment to gender equality principles, I think is a very important um, action that we all agreed to. And uh, we, we would hope that the public development bank community at, at large uh, will also uh, adopt and, and, and look at that as a guiding sort of objective in, in moving forward. Uh, and, and maybe I'll also highlight item number 10, uh, increasing transparency on targets, results, and development uh, impacts. Uh, as many of you know, and, and many of the audience know, you know, what gets measured gets done. Uh, and in, in, in the gender space, that's not any different. Um, you know, we need to have uh, data that captures uh, gender, uh, gender commitments and, uh, and, and, and gender impacts. And for that, we need to have transparency, stated goals, and also a measurement system that everybody agrees on is robust uh, and doesn't lead to, uh, uh, you know, they call it greenwashing in the, in, in the climate space, but we want to make sure that what is being put out there is robust. So I just wanted to highlight two of those 10 items, uh, and, and I'm sure as we go through the rest of the session, some of these other items will come up. Um, and next slide, please. I think this may be the last slide. Uh, and I just wanted to also just take a moment to thank uh, the banks who were participating in the working group. You have a pictorial there uh, with all of the banks. I said there were close to 35, 40, maybe 50 banks that were involved in the working group uh, over a six to nine month period to get, to get us to this stage. Next slide, please. Uh, and then also highlight the partners that we had uh, as, 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 uh, for this effort. So as you can see, it was a very collaborative global effort with private sector players, public sector players, um, uh, various um, uh, foundations and NGOs involved also to, to, uh, to, to input into this process. Next slide, please. 
And lastly, I just wanted to also acknowledge uh, the signatories of, of the Finance and Commons Summit Statement on Gender Equality. This had started last year, uh, and that process continues, and we may, I think we may even have some more signatories being announced later today. Um, so I think that was the last slide there, and with that, I'm actually going to turn to the second part of the session, which is essentially framing the issue uh, and, and the discourse of international institutions on gender and climate. And uh, we're going to start this session. We can get rid of the slide. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start this session with uh, uh, Suzanne Beagle. Uh, I think many of you probably don't need an introduction to Suzanne. She's been in the gender space for quite some time. And uh, as you know, she's the founder of Catalyst at Large. Uh, so let me turn it over to you, Suzanne, uh, to give your remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vipul, and thank you for everyone being here on such an important topic right before the COP. Uh, so Suzanne Beagle, I wear two hats, Catalyst at Large, but also I'm the co-founder of Gender Smart, which is a global community and a summit, uh, which is focused on unlocking unprecedented gender smart capital at scale uh, with more impact uh, and more sustainability. We have a climate and gender working group, which has been going for almost two years now, uh, at Gender Smart, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but we're also very close partners with the 2X Collaborative and the 2X Challenge, and I'll give a little bit of uh, color around what's happening in the world of 2X, although Barbara Rambusek from EBRD, I know, is going to speak a bit about 2X as well. Um, so what are we talking about when we talk about um, what is on the table for us? One is that most people still don't understand the nexus of climate and gender investing. They don't realize uh, in the investment sphere, especially in the climate investment sphere, what it means to look at women's leadership, women's ownership, where the opportunities are in employment, in innovation, where the opportunities are in terms of products and services and customers and throughout the value chain. And so part of the imperative that we're all facing is to help people understand the what, what are we talking about and the why, why now, why is this so important in this moment? When you have over a trillion dollars of capital moving in climate finance, but you have less than 20 billion of capital moving in gender finance, the opportunity is to look to climate finance to really unlock what if all climate finance really had a gender lens? Um, and what if we really had both an intentional strategy where we're consciously getting capital to funds and vehicles and infrastructure projects and individual companies that are demonstrating gender equity but what if we're also looking at any investment and saying where are the opportunities and the risks by paying attention to gender um, or by not conversely not paying attention to gender in your portfolio? Um, and in 2021, the imperative as we look to have a climate smart future is that women must have a seat at the table as investors. They must have a seat at the table as entrepreneurs, as those who are in the mix of uh, where we're putting our investment capital um, and across the entire sector of not only those deploying investment capital, but the intermediaries, the entire realm of the finance sector uh, that are not only those immediately deploying capital, but also who are helping move that capital and to have equal representation from those who are the recipients of capital to have a seat at the table. Where does climate justice with a gender lens come in? That's when we're really thinking as well about where are the most marginalized communities, whether it is around gender, racial equity, ethnicity, looking at refugee populations and migration, thinking about those that really haven't had a seat at the table and saying, where can we really look to have voice, agency, ownership uh, in those decisions that are being made around climate finance? So we tend to think about the climate justice lens as being part of the overall climate and gender uh, area of focus. Now, who's doing this? We know that the development finance institutions, the leading edge ones, uh, many of you are here, are moving capital in this way, and many of whom are part of the 2X Collaborative already. The 2X Collaborative started as the Gender Finance Collaborative in 2018, launched the 2X Challenge, and now has been uh, relaunched as the Gender Finance the uh, 2X Collaborative, and has more than 20 signatories. Um, and is open to all of you to be members. Um, and this is a very where we have a very strong partnership, as I mentioned, again, to unlock unprecedented gender smart capital at scale. But who else is moving this capital? It's the pension funds. It's the 
fund managers in the asset management industry. It is people doing bonds. So not only gender bonds, but climate and sustainability link bonds. It is those people who are in the intermediary sector, as I mentioned, not only the people who are um, raising capital for funds and vehicles, but also the lawyers and the rest of the intermediary sector. It's people who are in civil society who are playing a role in identifying what good looks like from a gender standpoint and from a, a climate standpoint. And in the gender smart community, we bring all of these communities together, both on the public and private side, but also on the um, private investing side, as well as the publicly listed side. So we're, we're very sort of op broad open and open tent, and obviously also all the UN agencies that are part of the picture. One of the things that we're really out to do is also to demystify that this is not only in energy or only in agriculture, but this is in infrastructure. This is in the sustainable cities work. It's in circular economy. It's in the built environment. And to help people understand if they're looking at a, um, as I look at Barbara Rambusek, who's here, uh, some fantastic examples in transportation, in, the, in affordable housing, I mean, the areas that we know have the biggest impact if we get it right on both climate and on gender. Um, the 2X criteria, I think probably all most must be familiar with it by now, really is a framework that we're all adopting that is really helping people see that you can look at ownership, leadership, employment, value chains, and, and products and services, whether you're investing directly into a company or whether you're looking at an infrastructure project or whether you're investing through a third-party intermediary, a bank, a financial institution, or a fund manager. We're talking about um, the opportunity then to say how. And in my last few minutes here, I'll just say, we, we think we've really moved from the why and the why now to the what and now to the how. How are people really, and looking at those 10 principles that are in this report, um, to really help people understand you need a strategy, you need to be able to look at your current portfolio and see where are you already making impact and where do you have the opportunities to make impact. Um, you've got to really be able to get granular and to say, what instruments am I using? Where am I, um, what kind of capital am I moving? with what kinds of partners and what kinds of constraints do those partners have and what kinds of opportunities do those partners have? Where can the development community come in with grant capital and blended finance in addition to the commercial finance actors? Um, and to really understand the tools and the methodologies that are there to help people go in and make a gender smart portfolio and to work with companies, to work with institutional partners to say, how do I uh, help on the policies and practices, not just on who's on the board, who's in the C-suite, where's the employment, but also what are the policies and practices and what does good look like in terms of the impact that we're really aiming for. So our community at Gender Smart and in partnership with the 2X community is so excited that uh, 2X is coming out with a set of guidance notes. The first one is up on the web already and it's on agriculture and food. Uh, but there are a dozen of these guidance notes um, that are sector specific and they have toolkits so that anyone who is looking to increase the effectiveness of gender and climate in their portfolio can get down to that next level of the how. What due diligence questions do I ask? What kinds of uh, opportunities do I have from an impact management and measurement standpoint? How can I really deploy my capital in this way? So I'm just so excited to be here with all of you again and my fellow panelists to uncover uh, where these opportunities are to really make headway as we move into the COP and then move into 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for that very uh, informative and 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 well uh, well spoken session. And before I turn, to, so thank you for that. And before I turn to Maxime, I just want to say to the audience that uh, there is a Q and A uh, intervention that's planned for the hour, uh, and I would like to invite participants to type their questions in the chat as the thematic session is going on, and we will take them uh, it, it towards the end of the uh, end of the panel. Uh, with that, I will turn to uh, Maxime Forrest, who, uh, who is the associate researcher and lecturer at, at, lecturer at Sciences Po in, in Paris. Uh, and, and, and Maxime, I think what we'd like you to le uh, touch upon is based on your work and research that you've done, what is the issue we have today as we frame and we look to frame gender equality, climate change, and funding? So please, over to you. 
Yes, thank you first of all for the for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to be with you here and to to share part of this work we uh, we made commissioned by the AV. Uh, well, my, the bottom line of my answer would be that there is no one single issue uh, with uh, climate action and gender. Actually, we uh, from this research we have done, uh, we found that there were at least eight different issues built around it. That is eight different frames, policy frames, understandings uh, of the uh, nexus between gender and climate. Um, so these different understandings, these different diagnoses are of course uh, linked with different solutions, different type of solution. So the research we have been carrying um, out uh, for the AFD was primarily about that. It was a mapping uh, of the different uh, discourses uh, competing in articulating the nexus between gender and climate action. And for uh, doing that, uh, what we did is that we built uh, kind of an unprecedented uh, uh, body of literature, uh, about 800 policy documents produced by uh, 54 organizations, transnational uh, uh, NGOs, international organization, including most of the UN system, uh, of course, uh, a multilateral uh, fun funding organization, national development agencies, epistemic communities. Um, and uh, building this, uh, this, uh, this body of, uh, of reference documents, which is the largest uh, to our knowledge ever built so far, just to give you a, a comparison, uh, the, the biggest thesaurus that is currently available online is the one uh, accessible from the uh, UNFPCC uh, website, and uh, it's about 10 times smaller. So uh, it was important for us to have this significant amount of documents. Those documents we analyze by coding them, so uh, with uh, um, keywords and attached to different concepts, so that we could characterize the different discourses over uh, gender and, uh, and climate action uh, nexus. Um, and doing so uh, uh, in different languages uh, uh, through a software-based uh, analysis, uh, we came up with basically four um, very frequent uh, framing around those issues. And I would focus on two uh, uh, here, which are more relevant to uh, the two most relevant categories for this panel, that is the one of uh, multilateral funding organization and of national development agencies. Uh, uh, we found also four which are a bit more emerging and that we find interesting in the sense that they may orientate uh, future action and future step in the field. But let's focus first maybe uh, on those that we have, uh, we have found to be uh, the most uh, frequent. Um, those two, uh, the, the two most frequent ones uh, uh, are the following. Uh, one consists in gendering emergency climate action through the lens of vulnerab vulnerabilities. So here, climate action is primarily understood uh, in the context of emergency and humanitarian action, for instance, in relation to climate-induced risks of disaster, post-disaster intervention, post-displacement. And uh, it is framed as addressing vulnerabilities such as poverty, lack of agency, illiteracy, greater exposure to the impact of climate change, something that uh, we, uh, we, we know is well documented. The other one, which is dominant for multilateral funding organization, which is kind of logical, uh, is one that we tagged as gendering climate action, uh, sorry, gendering climate change as smart economics. So in this framing, women and girls are addressed uh, primarily as potential economic agents of the green transition, uh, whom involvement is key to advance towards carbon neutral, climate resilient and socially and environmentally sustainable economies and societies. So the focus is placed on women's access to credit, to education and training, to digital and green skills uh, through specific actions and schemes, in particular in the realms of finance, uh, of capacity building and uh, of uh, innovation. So these are the two frames that are the most widely present uh, on the global stage across the five different categories of stakeholders I have earlier mentioned. 
uh, but also they are present uh, to a different extent. Um, in the case of multilateral funding organization, uh, uh, the framing consisting in gendering climate change as smart economics is very much dominant. So it, it kinds of um, uh, blurs uh, other potential uh, articulations of this uh, nexus between gender and climate. Um, and what we uh, also uh, found is that um, a very technical framing like mainstreaming gender and climate change agenda or uh, a more classic one, I would say, like uh, empowering women and girls for climate adaptation are also pretty much present. What those frames have in common that we should be aware of, I think, um, is that um, in a way they are, they are little transformative. They, uh, they do start from the status quo, from the, state, uh, the status quo of the power relation between genders. Uh, and they do not necessarily aim at uh, a full scale transformation that will in return uh, uh, create more impact in tackling uh, climate change uh, uh, and achieving uh, climate justice. So this has been in particular uh, uh, our concern to, uh, Maxime, to, uh, could I just request you to wrap that. up within one minute? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So this is what we actually wanted for, to, to emphasize from this study. Uh, the fact that there is a more technocratic approach to gender mainstreaming combined with one focusing on women as economic agent or framing this uh, nexus through the notion of vulnerabilities. But we would emphasize that um, women are not only victims of climate change. They are part of the solution as well, as it was earlier put by Suzanne, I think. And uh, uh, we should um, pay more attention to uh, articulation of that nexus that help us to move forward and to really bring transformation, addressing intersectionality, uh, um, addressing also uh, using uh, changing gender relation as a powerful lever for tackling climate change. And I don't think we are yet there. So you will find more about this study soon uh, on the AFD website, also in English. Thank you very much, Maxime, for, for framing the academic uh, uh, discussion and, 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 and the impetus for why we are doing what we're doing. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, let, me, let, let us next uh, turn to the important topic of understanding how public development banks uh, fund the nexus between climate and gender, climate change and, and gender. And for this panel, I would like to invite the Asian Development Bank, uh, the EBRD, European Bank uh, in London, uh, and um, uh, uh, BSA from, from Argentina uh, to, to give their perspective. I want to first turn it over to Samantha Hung uh, at the ADB in Manila. And I think Samantha gets the prize for being up latest uh, in this panel, very, very late at night for you, Samantha. So thank you very much. And I will also just add that the Asian Development Bank was a very uh, strong partner with us in the working group uh, to get us this far. So with that, over to you, Samantha. Thank you very much, Vipul. It's a pleasure to be here despite um, the late hour. I'm actually in New Zealand at the moment. So um, I think that the previous two speakers have done a really good job with framing. And what I'd like to do now in, in a very short few minutes is just to give you a sense of how ADB approaches this. So actually, the Asian Development Bank has been working on gender and climate for over a decade now, and it really started back in 2011 uh, when we had our first technical assistance in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, which focused on developing capacity at country level to mainstream gender into climate change policy. Um, and a lot has happened since then, and we've really seen over this decade a, a sea change in the recognition at policy level amongst development finance institutions that gender responsive climate action and empowering women um, can really help societies become more resilient to the impacts of the changing climate. And you know, with a global pandemic, that urgency and the recognition has really become even stronger. So as a, as a bank, a development bank, in 2018 with our corporate strategy, Strategy 2030, we set at the highest level quite ambitious goals for both climate change and gender equality. Um, and those targets are that we call them twin targets because they're both 75%. So 
so um, we committed that 75% of all our projects, public sector and private sector, will support gender equality, and 75% will also address climate change. So this means that naturally, as an organization, the nexus and synergy um, has to be strong, uh, but it also makes us in some ways a bank where we put climate change and gender equality at the top, and in some ways, you could call us a climate and gender bank. Uh, so, but how do we do this? We do this because we have a very well established four tier project gender categorization system, which we apply to everything. And this system gives us the robustness and the way to measure, I think before you, you mentioned before, um, and a tool to track and report on this commitment and also holds us accountable to our board and other stakeholders to deliver on it. So, and it also requires a, a very intentional approach to addressing these two um, issues in tandem across our portfolio. So how do we do this? Um, well, we talked about, I think Maxine talked about the resilience framework. I mean, that's one way. It's, it's really um, recognizing the critical role that at the local level, women offer very um, valuable knowledge and capacity to help us underline the, um, understand the underlying drivers of vulnerability. And there's great power at grassroots level to help inform and influence the best use of our investment. So just a few examples at a project level of, of how we do this. Um, if we talk about uh, climate resilient agriculture in that sector, we know that women typically occupy lower value segments of value chains, um, but yet they have a key role in the provision use and production of harvesting, for example. So our projects in this sector focus on things such as ensuring that women through very clear targets and design, have access to the necessary training, information, and climate resilient agricultural production and distribution technology, and that we support women to transition to managing high value climate resilient crop, um, crops and livestock. We're also doing more in, um, in ocean health, for example, so um, how are we supporting women in um, fisheries and coastal communities? We have a, an MOU with the Nature Conservancy, which includes working on gender. So these, two, these kinds of partnerships also help us to, to develop and address these issues more comprehensively. Another area I'd like to mention is in terms of um, gender and energy, and that's also been mentioned before by other speakers. ADB has recently just approved our new energy policy, and we're very proud that we've actually managed to be able to gender mainstream that new policy quite well. And, and that's giving us, that will very uh, much inform everything that we do in the energy sector going forward. So through the energy sector, some ways that we do this is that in terms of the design of our energy infrastructure, we ensure that it's well informed by the different um, energy needs of women and their roles. We support their participation in um, policy and decision making um, through access to green jobs. Uh, how do we support women in supply chains as energy entrepreneurs? And through the, the partners that we work with, we also promote gender balance in the energy sector where women um, traditionally um, are underrepresented and, and how would we move them up sort of the different leadership chain in these um, companies, uh, energy utility companies, for example, or ministries, relevant ministries, depending on public or private. And lastly, just to say that, um, you know, we're working on a just transition, and we all know that this will require massive shifts in societies and economies. And as countries shift away from fossil fuels and pursue um, net zero and, and build resilience to climate change, there's a real opportunity to create a new paradigm for women's economic empowerment through the creation of quality jobs for women. And this includes um, targeted investment in STEM education for women and girls, to allow them to reap the benefit and prepare them with the skills for jobs in the growing energy sectors. We're actually um, about to conduct research on this area and we hope we'll, this will result in a policy paper next year. We'll be really happy to share with you. And lastly, just to say that we are, we are at ADB hosting an upcoming gender forum in November, in late November, and these are some of the issues that will be addressed. So we hope that some of you in the audience will join us for that event. Thank you, Rupal, back to you. Thank you very much, Samantha, for that uh, really succinct but very, very precise uh, intervention. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to ask, uh, turn actually to Barbara uh, at the EBRD in London. And Barbara, as you know, all eyes are on uh, Glasgow uh, in, in coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, and maybe you could give us some perspective on uh, 
both the EBRD's uh, efforts in, in gender and climate, but also what you think may happen with regard to this issue uh, in, in a couple of weeks. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm really delighted to be here today um, in, to discuss this very important topic. Um, I would also like to thank the AUP in particular, and of course, you and women for inviting me, um, and also for working with um, EBRD and other MDBs so closely on this important issue over such a long time now. Um, so, as we've heard from many speakers, and I'm not going to repeat what we already heard, the case for integrating a focus on gender equality into green investments is very important. Indeed, this is one of the key strategic priorities also of the EBRD and part of our next five-year institutional priorities, which are fully consistent with also the global gender-responsive recovery priorities, such as the Green Deal, Green Deal promoting a digital but also a just transition. Um, indeed, from the end of 2022, we will align all of our activities with the goals of the Paris Agreement, um, aiming to accelerate decarbonisation across our regions and, of course, supporting our countries to reach net zero emissions by 2050. So um, this is a huge undertaking for us as a, as a bank, um, but also for our clients, our, our policy partners, um, and of course also an area that we will promote very uh, actively together with all of our other partners at the upcoming COP. So this um, nexus between gender and green lies very much at the heart of also our efforts in relation to the Paris Agreement. Um, we are in fact also launching two new strategies um, before uh, the end of the year. One will be our new strategy for the promotion of gender equality and, and our new equality of opportunity strategy. And both of these um, have a gender lens and climate investments very much at their heart. We know that the opportunity for gender and, and climate smart investments is valued at a huge 23 trillion US dollars in emerging markets alone by 2030. And um, that is, of course, following the, the Paris Agreement. So I think the upcoming COP here will also hopefully um, set new standards and we will certainly work actively with our partners on that. At the EBRD, we have actually gained a lot of experience um, at this nexus between gender and green, uh, very similar to also what Samantha um, just outlined at the ABB. Uh, we have a range of different flagship programs where we very proudly have integrated a focus on gender uh, fully into our green investments. Uh, one is our green cities programs, uh, where we work across almost, well, actually now 50 cities across our regions to accelerate the transition to low carbon cities, whilst at the same time also promoting women and men's equal opportunities, particularly in the infrastructure sector. We have our green economy financing facilities, um, the GEFs, which are working across 11 countries, where we actually work with local banks to ensure that both men and women entrepreneurs have access to green finance, low carbon technology, and also the advisory service and capacity building that is needed in this context. And then another example is our work in, in Egypt and Kazakhstan, where we leverage the partnerships that we have with the private sector, uh, particularly in the renewable sector, but also in others, as well as with national ministries for education, for example, to provide and uh, enable women to gain access to green skills and green jobs and enable them to enter careers in um, new and expanding um, high value added sectors. So what do we expect for, for the COP? Um, I think one of the key things that we would want to contribute there is some of the lessons that we have learned, which hopefully will also uh, shape the, the, the discussions there and, and then shape the, the upcoming activities, um, both for us, but for our fellow, fellow MDBs as well as other partners. So let me just share four of the key uh, lessons that we have learned in this context. The first lesson um, is that women are key to the solution. In a way, we cannot fight climate change um, and come up with sustainable solutions if women are not central to, to, to any of those efforts. We know that women experience greater negative outcomes um, from the climate crisis, but without their contribution and without um, really including women and the focus on gender equality into the design and implementation, uh, none of the, um, the changes that we want to make, both in terms of financing, in terms of operations, in ter terms of activities and policies, will have the impact that is required. So, um, in a way, women, therefore, are, are the, the, the key drivers, the key engines, the, the catalyst that we need uh, in order to affect change. This is also backed up by some of the studies that we have reviewed. Um, indeed, we looked at 17 studies across the world where the presence of women, for example, in conservation and nature 
resource management has resulted in stricter and more sustainable extraction rules, greater compliance, more transparency and accountability, and also better conflict resolutions. So it's uh, effective climate solutions can only be achieved by empowering women and addressing also social norms around gathering fuel and water, subsistence farmers, farming and unpaid care. Concretely, for example, ad addressing inequality in agriculture can increase women's access to better technologies, farming practices, and open up access to finance and innovations. And that to get together has the potential to prevent 2 billion tons of emissions between now and 2050. The second um, key uh, lesson that we learn is data is key. We need to understand the impact of climate change, but also we need to, in a way, make the business case for integrating a focus on gender equality into green investments more clearly. And we can't do that without data. Unfortunately, and I'm sure I, I don't just speak for EBRD here, but the business case for integrating gender into green investments is not always heard yet. There are still- Barbara, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I ask you to just maybe wrap up in the next one minute, sure. please? Thank there you. are still often voices that argue that you cannot do both at the same time. So having data is, is important. What we have done is, um, as part of our green economy financing facilities, we undertook a detailed baseline assessment to better understand what are the specific challenges that women face, but also to actually see what is the opportunity there in terms of business. What we found is that women are climate aware business leaders and consumers, and therefore there's actually a huge potential, but a still underserved market for green banking products. So it's in the interest of investors, in the interest of banks and lenders to tap, tap into this market segment, to design products and services that specifically enable women uh, to um, um, invest in green technologies. We also see from the data, there's a lot of awareness, um, but little knowledge, but a lot of interest in acquiring that knowledge on the part of women entrepreneurs, uh, particularly. Um, and then maybe let me come to the, the final lesson learned is that partnerships are key. And here I won't repeat what we already heard from Suzanne. Uh, we are working in close partnership, for example, we will be launching a gender smart climate financing investment guide that we um, developed together with the EIB and also the CDC at the upcoming COP, again, to provide the guidance and, and the, the lessons learned and shared best practice uh, to integrate gender across 12 different sectors um, um, as part of our, our overall investments. We're also active in the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition at par part of the 2X challenge that, that Suzanne already mentioned. We are launching a green and gender fast track initiative and so forth and so forth. So it's really amplifying the impact that we can have through partnerships and by working with others, um, which is um, the final message that I want to give here um, and one that we will also make at the COP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, uh, thank you. And I, I, I apologize if, if, I, if I cut short a little bit of your intervention. So best of luck to you and all of us, really, uh, as we head into Glasgow uh, next month. Uh, with that, let me turn to our last but not least speaker uh, from Argentina, um, BC Bank. Uh, Gabriel, over to you. And if I could please ask you to keep your intervention to about four or five minutes, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Over to you, Gabriel. OK, that's no problem. Good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. For us, it is an honor to be part of this second finance common summit and to participate on this agenda. We believe that national development banks, we must join forces to direct finance towards sustainable development with social inclusion, particularly with women who have systematically been relegated from the financial system. BICE is the development bank of Argentina and we focus on financing businesses to grow in a sustainable way. We believe that confronting climate change can be the road to both reduce gender inequality and to empower women in, in the country. Right now in Argentina, most SMEs find it really difficult to access financing, and this issue is even more pressing for companies like the women. According to a study BC conducted with the Intermedical Development Bank, the IDB, the gender gap in access to loans in the country is immense. Only 20% of the companies led by women use bank loans to finance their investment. This is compared to 33% in the case of men. And in the case of SMEs, this gap is even greater. Additionally, we found in the study that 26% of women believe that most banks' loans are designed from a male perspective. And this is why BSA is mainstreaming the gender and diversity perspective in its portfolio, particularly in its climate portfolio. For us, 
it has been crucial to learn what other public development banks are doing around the world. So I want to particularly mention the job IDFC and AFD have been doing in promoting and the exchange of information and good practices. Nowadays, in Visa, we are integrating a gender perspective to every credit line that we offer, as well as increasing representation of women in our decision-making process. Our main goal is to strengthen the participation of women in the private sector. And in order to do this, we created a line that is called Mujeres que Lideran, in Spanish, or Women Who Lead, which promotes and supports SMEs owned by women or that had women in their board of directors or senior management. This program has a comprehensive approach as it provides both financing and non-financial products like training. Also, for the first time in almost 30 years, Visa's board of directors has two women uh, that represents 20% of the board. Obviously, we know that this is not enough, but for us, this is a significant first step in the right direction. On the other hand, as part of our commitment to coordinate this agenda with the rest of the financial system, Visa is a very active player in a special group of women that are directors of public banks that is organized by the Argentine Central Bank. And Visa has also been at the forefront in the Argentine financial system to agree on a uniform taxonomy to better identify women-owned enterprises, evaluate programs with a common denominator, and to implement consistent inclusion policies. Additionally, last year we created in our bank a gender and diversity committee in order to improve our coordinated action on this agenda. And one of the main issues we are attacking now is culture. In order to generate a cultural change in Vise, all of our staff have undergone a training and awareness program on gender inclusion. And this training is part of a larger strategy from the national government. It's named Micaela's Law. And its, its name comes from a victim of a femicide that establishes mandatory training on gender issues and violence against women for all public administration employees. Sustainability and climate change are also at the top of our strategy. To tackle this issue, BISE has a credit line granted by the Green Climate Fund, which is EF, and implemented by the IDB, which supports energy efficiency projects in SMEs. GCF is also the first climate finance mechanism to include gender perspective as an essential decision-making factor to allocate resources. In addition, BISE issued the first sustainable bond in Argentina and the first of this type in South America for $30 million in a five-year term. This bond was specially designed to finance projects with a positive social and environmental impact, and it contributed to the largest number of sustainable development goals compared to any bond of this kind in Latin America. To end, we all know the current level of climate finance is still not enough and that we are not creating enough opportunity for women, which is one of the reasons we, this summit is taking place right now. Therefore, at BC, we are working to improve the connection between gender and climate finance in all the credit lines that, that we launch. Well, again, I want to thank you all for the invitation. Thank you for the permanent cooperation. And I look forward to discussing further during the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Gabriel, thank you very much for that very, very succinct but yet effective uh, talk from, from Argentina. And it was really good to get a very country-specific perspective on this panel. So thank you again. Uh, and with that, I will turn now to our distinguished uh, Deputy Director General from our partner, uh, AFD, uh, Marie-Helena Boisson, uh, for the concluding remarks. Uh, over to you, Marie-Helena. Uh, and perhaps we can put up the slide of the partners now, too. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, people, for animating this debate, and uh, thank you to all the speakers for your useful and uh, uh, very interesting uh, remarks and ideas about, uh, about this topic. Uh, I think what we have heard today is very illustrative of what is the global dynamic of the Finance in Common Summit and, and Coalition, which is really how PDBs can uh, join forces to uh, uh, reach uh, more easily and accelerate the achievement of uh, SDG exchange ideas and experiences and best practices. And I think the coalition, the gender coalition that we put together uh, some time ago has really uh, reached uh, this, uh, this objective as you all uh, underlined. Uh, the, the second thing is really uh, what we saw in your interventions is obviously the importance of uh, this uh, 
um, gender equality, climate change and biodiversity uh, nexus. And it was interesting to hear how the different institutions um, um, put this together, uh, whether it is through the twin targets of ADB or at EBRD also, and, and um, NBC also talked about it. Uh, at AFD, as you may know, we have two pillars in our strategy. Uh, one is 100% Paris Agreement, and the other one is 100% uh, uh, social link. So we have also built very uh, deeply in our strategy and objectives uh, the goal of uh, achieving um, climate justice and uh, and more and more social equality. Maybe what uh, we can have as takeaways, I think, of um, of today's debate, uh, maybe three things uh, before concluding is, I think the first one is really what you said is women are part of the solution. And not only as economic agent, as was stressed by Maxime, but also as decision maker and also as holder of uh, solutions and, and precious knowledge without which we can't really uh, go forward. So I think that's one interesting uh, takeaway. The other one that I have um, noted is uh, uh, what Suzanne mentioned about, um, and also I think uh, Samantha or maybe uh, Barbara, but the importance of partnerships, because uh, the research that uh, IFD did about PDBs is that uh, the total investments of PDBs represent 10% of uh, investment flows in the world, which is a lot, but it's still 10% only. And obviously, if we don't work with other economic agents as fund managers, uh, banks, and so on, well, we can't pretend to uh, redirect the financial flows and have the systemic impact that uh, we would like to have. Um, and also, the third takeaway is uh, uh, also that if we want to mainstream these objectives of um, climate and, and gender, it has to be not only in you know education and health and agriculture, uh, even if it's very important to do that in those sectors, but also in everything we do, whether it's infrastructure, transportation, energy, and so forth. So thank you for these uh, ideas. And there is a lot more in all you said, but obviously uh, uh, I think there will be um, also a summary of, of, of the debate. Just a few words also about what IFD is doing as a feminist development agency. Uh, obviously we are uh, committed internally and externally um, to promote gender equality and women's empowerment, including uh, addressing the link uh, between climate change uh, gender and biodiversity. Just to give you two examples, uh, we have the Adapta Adaptation program. We had a first phase um, that is now almost completed with 15 million euro uh, of grants, and we are now launching the second phase with an additional 15 million euro grant. And the purpose is really to um, uh, help vulnerable populations and ecosystems in partner countries to become more resilient to the impacts of climate change and also to build capacities of countries in defining and implementing resilient and inclusive development uh, trajectories in, in their countries. And also in the second phase, and based also on the priorities uh, that partner countries have uh, included in their NDCs and adaptation plans, uh, we have put the nexus between climate, uh, biodiversity, resilience, and social linkages at the heart of this second phase. Uh, and so included in the funding is also um, the, um, the project to fund feminist organizations on gender and climate change projects. We have presented that to our uh, committee uh, this, uh, this month with an envelope of 5 million euro. Uh, it's, a, it's a call for projects and so we'll be very uh, uh, interested to see uh, uh, all the proposals that, um, that we have on, on those uh, challenges. Um, we are also very happy of the different reports that was, uh, you know, Maxim explained uh, what is in the uh, study uh, that we commissioned to, to Sciences Po. And we are also very proud of the important report that was mentioned uh, on, uh, you know, PDB's driving gender equality that was co-written with the uh, uh, UN Women and presented by Anita just uh, earlier during the session. And I take the opportunity to really extend uh, the uh, warm thanks to UN Women for um, working with us uh, on uh, animating uh, the, the work streams and putting together the, the session. Uh, so uh, 
just to conclude, and maybe if the slide can be uh, uh, showed again on the uh, signatories uh, of the gender statement um, that was signed uh, for the first time uh, uh, a few months ago with the, I think, 30 uh, PDBs, and I'm very glad to uh, announce, as uh, Vipul uh, uh, also said earlier during the session, that three additional PDBs have signed uh, and joined the coalition. Uh, this is the FINDETER uh, in Colombia, Financial Corporation for Territorial Development, uh, the Banco do Nordeste in Brazil, and also the uh, uh, Banco Nacional de Costa Rica. And so we are very glad to welcome uh, the three uh, PDBs in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the coalition. So thanks again to uh, all the banks participating, to the working groups and to the coalition. Uh, to, to all the partners, and I really encourage all of us to continue uh, working on climate justice, uh, gender, and, uh, and climate objectives, and I look forward to continuing uh, working with all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Maria Elena, um, for, for those uh, concluding remarks. Uh, and uh, I would just like to ask uh, the participants and anyone else who has not yet joined the coalition to please do, uh, do so join our coalition uh, and sign the statement on gender equality and women's empowerment for development banks and through development banks. And with that, let me just thank all of my excellent high-level uh, speakers, particularly uh, Maria Elena and Isa Bhatia, uh, all my panelists, uh, and certainly the participants who, who bared with us to be a little bit over, over schedule. Uh, and thank you to the technical team for allowing that to happen. With that, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And we hope to see you soon.